So I am a, uh, a data scientist with ATB. Uh, looking at the crowd, I think most people probably don't know what uh, ATB is. So ATB is a bank that is specifically in Alberta, and um, and it yeah only it only offers banking services to Albertans, but otherwise than that, it functions very similarly to uh, a lot of the other big banks in Canada. Um, and just a quick background on myself, I studied financial engineering at the University of Toronto with a specialization in machine learning. Uh, I did management consulting with Deloitte, and then I moved over to ATB as a data scientist. And the topic that I want to talk about today, uh, kind of two different topics actually, is one, analyzing the frequency domain, and then more uh, as well as that, unsupervised learning with financial time series data. So... Um, um, one thing that uh, I noticed when I started at ATB is that a lot of the low-hanging fruit, particularly with supervised learning, has already been picked. And I think Stephen touched upon this, um, which is, you know, they have a bunch of models already deployed, I think probably a lot of the times in supervised learning domains. So, you know, time series forecasting, taking fraud models that basically take labeled fraud and extend those to um, to find other fraud that is similar to that labeled fraud or doing any kind of product recommendation. Uh, those types of problems have in large part um, already been implemented. Um, and so when I started working in this domain, um, there's kind of three things that I could try to do, which is one, you know, try to do reinforcement learning, which was actually um, you know, quite a difficult task given the uh, complexity of, you know, trying to build an action state and, and like basically trying to try to build out the environment for a bank. The amount of levers that we can tune was maybe a too ambitious of a task. Um, there's, you know, maybe some small wins in terms of clever ways of finding labels uh, you know, new labels for doing more supervised learning. But what I decided to focus in on was actually unsupervised learning. And the, the reason for that was, um, was actually in large part to get better domain knowledge, you know, you know to, to, to actually try to analyze what data there is and, and, you know, what patterns exist in that data. And, and then, um, build insights off of that rather than, you know, going deeper and deeper into building more and more complex and, you know, technically accurate, but less explainable and less robust um, supervised learning models. Um, so I went kind of a lot back to basics, you know, using very traditional machine learning techniques, just unsupervised learning, try to understand what the data is uh, that I'm looking at. And in particular, really in my, this is my opinion, which is that the core of unsupervised learning is understanding how the data separates. So what part of the data, you know, what, what data points are close together to each other and therefore very similar and what data points are, are uh, very, very much far apart. So here I've got uh, a 10 cluster dendrogram. Um, I couldn't use a real example um, because of, uh, of the proprietary nature of the data, but but basically what this is showing is um, an, a, a hierarchical clustering algorithm that's been used. But if you actually change the way in which you're cutting, uh, you know what what your cutoffs are, you end up separating cluster three from all of the other clusters because it's significantly further away. Um, the y-axis in this graph is distance from the other clusters. Um, and that actually just turns a clustering algorithm into an anomaly detection algorithm. And this is something that we actually did implement when we were doing customer segmentation. Um, we, we used a uh, high cutoff to, to eliminate all of the, uh, the individual data points that were the furthest away from all of our clusters to, um, to then do the clustering for a reduced data set. So, so I really, zeroed in on unsupervised learning as the topic that I focus on um, within machine learning 
And really within that, um, one, what I really want to talk about actually today is a specific um, technique that, that I found very useful um, because of the nature of the data that I'm working with. So a useful property of transactional data is it's not just time series data. Uh, it's actually cyclical time series data. So people have fixed transactions week to week, month to month, year to year, right? And so like, you know, when you do time series forecasting, the, the, the kind of critical benefit that you're getting from the fact that it's time series data is that you can look at consecutive time series uh, data points uh, in conjunction with each other, right? So like if you think about an LSTM passing in one data point after the other, um, what, what that lets you do is, is basically um, if there's you know, similarities of two individuals in, in a data point or in a time point that is close but not the same, you still capture uh, um, the fact that those people are similar. Uh, but what I actually want to talk about is not the deep learning side, because I think there's tons of uh, literature and, and talks that are done about how to use an LSTM for time series analysis. What I want to specifically talk about right now is, um, is cyclical data and the pure math transform that I think is very, very underused in the analysis of cyclical data, and that is the Fourier transform. So um, probably a lot of people know what the Fourier transform is, some people don't. So, I mean, here's the, the, uh, the description, you know, of, of the actual equation of what the Fourier transform is. Not worrying about that too much. If we look at this diagram, I think it does a really, really good job of, um, of explaining what the Fourier transform is. So on the one axis, you can see the, uh, the time domain, which is showing the actual transaction pattern of some particular individual, right? And on the other axis, what you can see is the frequency domain. And what this is showing is that the time domain is made up primarily by adding together these three um, sine curves that essentially collectively mimic um, that time domain. And so to be clear, any curve of any shape can be mimicked by adding together infinitely many sine curves, right? With, um, with different frequencies and, and different amplitudes. So what this is basically showing is that the amplitudes of these three sine curves needs to be much larger than the rest of them to very, very accurately represent this function. So what does that mean as a practical application? What this actually is telling us is that this time curve replicates at these particular frequencies. And that is an incredibly useful um, tool, at least in my experience. So when I'm actually doing unsupervised learning, a lot of the time, I like to do it on the frequency domain. So if I do my uh, customer segmentation, I'm doing my clustering, you know, you can use whatever clustering method you want to use, but before actually doing the clustering, I do a transform on my data into the frequency domain. So then what you're looking for is, are, you know, are people transacting at similar frequencies to each other? You're not so much worried about, you know, do their transactional patterns like across a whole bunch of time look similar, right? You're not getting bogged down and trying to use some like DTW, which is an incredibly slow algorithm. A Fourier transform is super fast. And um, because financial data is so cyclical in nature, and that is not something that is limited to financial data. Like I think a lot of um, time series analysis, you are dealing with cyclical data. The Fourier transform is a super useful tool, um, you know, and I think that it, uh, I would recommend to people who are, you know, jumping in, like trying to use extremely complicated machine learning techniques, 
Um, take a look at it. You know, it's really good for uh, for supervised learning methods as well, right? To it, to to take your data and and feed it in as a uh, as a different feature set. Um, you know, I think there were some some uh, questions about dimensionality reduction or, or feature selection in previous talks as well. So this is a great way of doing um, feature selection as well, uh, where, you know, one thing that I might do, right, is if I have like a, a bunch of, of time series data, which is ultimately coming in, coming out to be like several thousand features, uh, you do a Fourier transform, but you only consider the initial features for uh, free, like you're, you're basically only considering low frequency um, cycles as important or medium frequency cycles as important for the particular uh, type of problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and, I, and I think that also points to, again, uh, Stephen's message about having the domain knowledge to actually um, use this in a way that makes sense for the particular problem that you're trying to solve. So anyway, I know this is a very narrow topic for a presentation, but, um, but I think that the broader point that I'm trying to make is that there is a lot of pure math where having domain knowledge lets you apply that pure math rather than trying to take a very complex algorithm that the benefit of the complex algorithm is that it can basically fold into a very, very specific shape that fits the data perfectly. So you may not need to have the domain knowledge to be able to use it. But the benefit of using more traditional methods is that you're not worried that the algorithm has really folded into a shape that um, that will not generalize into situations that are significantly different. Whereas something like a Fourier transform, you know, you're, it will work no matter what the data that's coming into it is. Well, uh, we've got a couple of questions, certainly from uh, Akshay. Um, he said, since frequency domain is pretty closely related to Egon vector transformation, uh, do you think representation of data in Egon vector can be something which can produce similar results um, for unsupervised techniques? Um, have you seen implementations of Kohon's self organizing maps in industry as well? Uh, yeah, so, so to answer your question, actually, about self-organizing maps, uh, yes, definitely have, have seen those. They, uh, they're, they're fairly valuable in time series analysis um, because, because they do take advantage of the fact that it's a time series. Um, yeah, so in terms of eigenvector transformation, I think it's a really valid point. Uh, it's not something that I personally... Um, looked into, but I but I do agree that uh, that it's a, a valid method um, for me to look at as well. So um, not, maybe not the most satisfying answer, but I, I don't know what other people are doing with eigenvectors, uh, eigenvector transformations. But I think that that's definitely the right line of thinking that I'm that I'm trying to emphasize. Um, and similar comment uh, to Philip, um, radial basis function expansions. Um, so again, I personally not been using that. I know someone else on my team was looking into that for one of their projects. Um, so I'm, I'm actually waiting on their uh, results to kind of compare them to what I've been doing with, uh, with the Fourier transform. Have you used any matrix profile to extend your analysis? It uses FFT under the hood uh, to do nearest neighbor motive discovery. Um, matrix profile. I, I'm not sure what matrix profile is. Let me let me look that up uh, afterwards. Uh, but obviously, I have not used it because uh, because I have not seen that technique. But I, I will keep it in mind. Um, That's all right. If, if you want, yeah, to, yes, take a look and maybe put put it in the chat later or something. Sure. We'll yeah. Move on to the next question. Uh, have you considered uh, using spline functions as basis functions? Uh, yes, 
I did do that. I'm trying to remember what the result of that would be, but but yeah, I, I have used uh, spline functions as basis functions. 